Betsy Golden Kellum has joined us once before for a program. I hope some of you were able to join us for that as well. Uh, she is a, an attorney and historian, and in both of these roles, she looks at how people consume, regulate, and enjoy mass media. She serves as marketing and intellectual property counsel for a Fortune 5 health and retail company. And then in her spare time, she's also working on her interest in history. And as a historian, Betsy believes that where we're headed as a society is often a direct product of what we enjoy and what we question and how we spend our free time. Her writing has been featured in the Washington Post, the Atlantic, Vanity Fair, Smithsonian and Atlas Obscura. And she has her own blog, which is Drinks with Dead People. I highly recommend it. It's got great fun stories and always makes me think a little more about the world. Uh, Betsy has taught at Yale University and at the University of Connecticut Law School. She is a member of the board of directors of the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And she loves P.T. Barnum and is work, working currently on a book about unusual women performers. I want to add Betsy is a member of the Circus Historical Society. And so today, along with members and guests of the Ringling Museum, we have invited members from the Barnum Museum and CHS. And we're really happy to have you all here with us while we listen to Betsy share some insights. And it's this is a great presentation. I'm extraordinarily excited to hear her go through the whole thing about Lavinia Warren, the fairy wedding, and the birth of celebrity culture. So Betsy, welcome. It's all yours. Thank you. Um, and thank you for having me. It's so great to see so many of you here. Thank you for taking time out of your day. Um, well, welcome. Um, today, we're going to meet Lavinia Warren, um, one of America's first bona fide celebrities in many ways. Um, she was a Massachusetts school teacher who as an adult stood barely just shy of three feet tall. Um, she initially entered show business and became famous at first because she was born with a variety of dwarfism. Um, but over a lifelong career, Lavinia Warren proved that she was so much more than just a physical curiosity. Um, we're gonna talk about the fact that she was a talented performer um, she was a fashion plate for the middle 19th century. And she was a very feisty personality and not afraid to show up, uh, stand up to media, to showmen, to dignitaries. Um, many people know her because she was married to Charles Stratton, who was General Tom Thumb, who you see here in the picture that's on the screen. You know, so she was Mrs. Tom Thumb in many ways, but she was also famous in her own right. Um, she traveled the world and when she died, she was a countess, which is fantastic. Um, and in many ways, she's part of how mass media created the celebrity machine, what we think of as, as fame and fortune today. So I wanna jump in just by kind of uh, giving a little background on Lavinia. Um, her full name was Mercy Lavinia Warren Bump and she was born on October 31st on Halloween of 1841 in Middleborough, Massachusetts, um, which is, for those of you who know the area, it's a town in Plymouth County. Um, she was born at a typical size, but stood out when around about her first birthday or so, she growth really slowed down dramatically. And by the time she was 10 years old, she was about two feet tall and weighed 20 pounds. Um, by all accounts, this was not an issue for her family. Um, they were not especially phased by the fact that she had some physical differences and they treated her as they did any of their other seven children. Um, she was expected to attend school and go to Sunday services uh, to help around the house. And which she did, by the way, her father built her a custom step stool so that she could reach things and participate in home life. Um, she was a skilled horseback rider. She notes in her autobiography that she was able to ride. So she was very, very much mainstreamed into her family and her community. Um, she also seems to have had a very sharp and sometimes mischievous sense of humor. Um, in her autobiography, she tells stories about um, sneaking around under the desks in her school classroom because they were uh, around the perimeter of the room. And because she was so small, she could go under the desks and run around the perimeter of the room without anyone seeing her. And she would pinch the other students to cause trouble um, and try to get back to her seat before the teacher could figure anything out. Um, 
There's also a great story she tells as that as a child, a local woman who was kind of very starchy New England Puritan was wagging her finger at her in church for being too much into fashion and not enough into the Lord. And Lavinia turned to her and quoted the Bible back at her and said, be not rash with thy mouth and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything. So she was she was physically small, but her personality was very, very large. Um, so it's when she was about 16, um, her town decided to split what was then effectively a one room all ages schoolhouse into an elementary school and a school for the older kids. And the town approached her to be its first teacher for the younger kids. And she was very happy about this and thought it was kind of a very proper um, job for her and really kind of figured that teaching would be her, her life's work. Um, that said, a visiting cousin at one point was a manager of a showboat uh, museum and, uh, that ran on the Ohio and the Mississippi rivers and kind of put a bug in Lavinia's ear about going out west and seeing some of the world. And you can absolutely see why this would be an exciting prospect. Um, so she, she went along. Um, and there are stories about on the, on the showboat, she met um, Stephen Douglas and Ulysses S. Grant and all kinds of other interesting, um, interesting people. By 1862, thanks to this career on the showboat, um, P.T. Barnum had heard of Lavinia Warren and sent one of his agents to Massachusetts to kind of talent scout um, and to offer her employment at the American Museum in New York City. Um, Barnum, now remember in 1842, had met, um, or 18, yeah, 1842, yeah, had met um, Charles Stratton, the little person who had become global star, General Tom Thumb. And, you know, Barnum knew from talent. So if he was sending someone to check out Lavinia, it was, it was significant. Um, and according to Barnum's autobiography, he um, had Lavinia and her family to Bridgeport um, to kind of talk everyone through about what, what it might be like if she were to work with him. And he convinced uh, her family that he was not entirely the humbug that rumors made him out to be. Um, so he arranged for her to come to New York um, where she was welcomed into the home of one of Barnum's daughters who was grown at that point. And Barnum got to work. Um, he plainly writes that he, he got to work procuring her wardrobe and her jewelry and making arrangements for a grand debut. And that debut um, happened in New York at the St. Nicholas Hotel, which was um, the first million dollar hotel in New York City. So this was very flashy. Um, and by all accounts, everybody was absolutely charmed. Um, Lavinia was presented to the press as a, you know, a perfect Victorian lady, graceful and lovely and refined in, in miniature. Um, the New York Tribune described her as moving, quote, about the drawing room with the grace and dignity of a queen, and yet she is entirely devoid of affectation, is modest and ladylike in her deportment. The New York Times said she was a miniature woman, I am the queen of them. So huge press reception. Now, so she's, she's embarked on her performance career. Now, General Tom Thumb, Charles Stratton, who I mentioned, was not actively performing with Barnum at this time. Um, he and Barnum very much kind of came up together in their fame in the early years of the American Museum. Um, Barnum and Charles Stratton first met each other when uh, Stratton was four, very, you know, very early on. And Charles Stratton had had a full career at this point, had helped Barnum out of his bankruptcy in the middle 1850s. Um, and he continued to tour, but he also very much was enjoying his home life in Bridgeport. Um, he loved yachting on Long Island Sound. He was very active in the Freemasons, um, but obviously he was still very much in the business. And one visiting the American Museum, he found himself very taken with Lavinia. Um, and the story goes, he took Barnum aside one day to ask if you know Barnum might put in a good word for him. And according to Barnum, his response was, I will not oppose you in your suit, but you must do your own courting. Miss Warren is no fool, and you will have to proceed very cautiously if you can succeed in winning her affections. Um, succeed he did, and a wedding was very soon on the books. So the fairy wedding, grand occasion. Um, and it's useful to remember here, 
1863, folks were pretty worn out, both emotionally, physically, from the Civil War. Um, and you can see why the idea of being distracted with a lavish New York celebrity wedding um, was welcome. So um, Barnum, P.T. Barnum allegedly offered um, Charles and Lavinia $15,000 to actually postpone their wedding for a few months so he could spend more time promoting it. He was selling tickets, he went to the museum, he was selling carte de visite. This was a great promotional opportunity. And they very politely uh, and without hesitation <laughs> declined the offer. Um, and that didn't stop Lavinia from teasing him and saying, eh, you should have offered at least a hundred grand. Um, she was not shy, by the way, about standing up to Barnum and consider that he was one of, if not the most famous person in the world at the time. Um, soon after hiring her, he asked her after this uh, debut at the St. Nicholas, okay, let's get going. You can start working at the American Museum. And she reminded him that he was contractually obligated to take her to Europe first. Um, so the wedding, Lavinia and Charlie, by some accounts had hoped for kind of a smaller and more modest wedding. Um, but there was so much public demand and pressure from Barnum. So they, they accepted the offer of having this grand, grand occasion. And grand it was, it was invitation only, and it was huge. And as, as you see here, promotion called it the fairy wedding. Um, there were 2000 invitations to the church, um, but Barnum, ever the opportunist, made sure that there was a separate reception at the Metropolitan Hotel so that more and different people could take part in this day. Um, not everyone was thrilled with the idea. Um, some people figured this had to be a publicity stunt at best. Um, and other people were angry that they thought this was a commercialized wedding being brought into the church. Um, a writer from the Brooklyn Eagle um, complained that, quote, the fittest place for the exhibition would be the American Museum and not in a house dedicated to the services of a holy religion. Um, side note, one imagines Commodore Nutt was not particularly thrilled either. Um, he is in this image here as uh, Charles Stratton's best man to his right. Um, his full name was George Washington Morrison Nutt. He was a little person who had been pretty recently brought in by Barnum to perform. And he was in the wedding party along with Minnie Warren, um, who was Lavinia's younger sister. Um, she was the only other child in the family uh, who was of short stature. Her name was Hulda, which was also their mother's name, but she went by Minnie. Um, there were rumors during this time where, you know, Lavinia was, had debuted and her courtship and okay, so the, you know, there was this will they, won't they between Charles Stratton, Commodore Nutt, who's going to win Lavinia's heart. Um, so there were, there were some suggestions that being best man was kind of a runner's up position that he wasn't all that happy about, but grumbles were a minority position. The streets outside the church, um, and for those of you who maybe know your Manhattan geography, we're talking lower Manhattan around the Union Square area. Um, streets were full of people trying to get a look, get a glimpse of the party in their outfits, get a look at famous guests who might be uh, arriving. There were people selling concessions and snacks. There were pickpockets. It was um, two hours of traffic jams with carriages in the area and there were police working outside to contain the crowds. Um, the New York Times said it was a breath expurgating, crinoline crushing, bunion pinching mass of conglomerated humanity. <laughs> um, it was a sensation. Everyone loved it. Enthusiasm and curiosity and news coverage um, just went bananas. And keep in mind, again, there's civil war news on the front pages and this is pushing it aside. Um, the New York, Harold said, here was the carnival of crinoline, the apotheosis of purple and fine linen. Uh, beautiful as the guests were, they were not dwarfs. How many wished they were, how many regretted their superb abundance. This is just, it's wonderful. Um, so after the ceremony, the couple retires to the Metropolitan Hotel and the crowd is tumbling all over themselves to get a glimpse of the carriage. Um, and at the reception, there was a large piano and um, the piano was used as a stage so everyone could see the bridal party. Um, people are dancing on the piano. It was a, it was a pretty wild party. Um, not to mention there were also some very lavish gifts. Um, there was a miniature silver horse and chariot from Tiffany's. 
um, as a wedding gift. President Lincoln received them afterwards. Um, and this great quote I love from the New York Times says, those who did and those who did not attend the wedding of General Thomas Thumb and Queen Lavinia Warren composed the population of this great metropolis yesterday. And thenceforth, religious and civil parties sink into comparative insignificance before this one query of fate. Did you or did you not see Tom Thumb married? So this was just a tremendous deal. Um, you can see here, this is this great uh, image in, from the Barnum Museum collections that shows the wedding party um, and some of them in their different costumes and um, performance outfits. So Lavinia wasn't wrong about the marketability here, clearly. Um, only days after the wedding, as I said, they went to Washington and were received at the Lincoln White House. Um, and the Lincoln's hospitality um, and warmth was remarked by both Charlie and Lavinia. And Lavinia said that, um, you know, President Lincoln stooped down to greet them. And he said, Mrs. Stratton, I wish you much happiness in your union. And they, they led the couple to a salon. They had seats on the sofa for conversation. Um, and there's a, a journalist, a woman journalist, her pseudonym was Grace Greenwood, who was there. And she noted that Lincoln said, had, quote, not the slightest touch of the exaggeration which a lesser man might have been tempted to make use of for the quiet amusement of onlookers. Um, so wedding, the wedding was a bonanza. Um, April newspapers said that the pair was going to appear for three days only before heading to Europe where they would be bringing their bridal presents and their outfits and kind of doing this reception line tour. Um, side note, um, the Barnum Museum has a preserved slice of the wedding cake from Charlie and Lavinia's ceremony. And this is something, if you go to the Barnum Museum's YouTube channel, there's a great little video about it. Um, and preserving cake is not as weird as it might seem. And it certainly sounded weird when I first heard about it. But there was a 19th century habit, apparently, of handing out pieces of cake in a favor box to your guests, just like wedding guests today have favors of different kinds. Um, so that was not unusual. And it was also somewhat traditional for the couple to save the top of the cake for their first child's baptism, because very often children were born within the year. Um, and it's still a tradition for couples to save their cake topper, um, though we keep it in the freezer. Um, also, the other thing that maybe makes this less gross than it seems is it was traditional for bride's cakes at the time to be plum cakes or fruit cakes, which means they were usually doused in alcohol. <laughs> um, the other kind of side note, interesting tradition that comes from uh, this wedding is a more modern tradition of Tom Thumb weddings, which are um, plays that were conducted, especially in the early 20th century um, by like churches or community groups, Elks clubs, that sort of thing. And it was a scripted play where you'd get a group of children from the community to put on their fancy dress and participate in a fake dramatic wedding ceremony with ushers and flower girls and the whole nine yards. Um, I actually have a script of one of these from the late 1800s, and it's full of these kind of bad jokes about naggy wives and who does the cooking. Um, so it's, it's this very interesting little legacy of the fairy wedding that continued. Um, it is... Unfortunate to note that in the script, the characters, the bride and groom are described as Tom Thumb and Jenny June. So Lavinia ends up erased kind of from this particular tradition. So to understand Lavinia in a modern sense and part of why this wedding was so popular, um, we can start with her embrace of high fashion. Um, Lavinia routinely appeared in these beautiful custom gowns and she was very often praised for her figure and called the queen of beauty. Um, something we can relate to, her appearances were a chance for people to see very luxurious bespoke designer clothing and to see it in person. Um, Barnum would routinely promote her and talk about how many costume changes she might make during an event or how much her dresses cost. Um, when she debuted it at the St. Nicholas in 1862, one of the New York papers said her gowns cost $2,000 a piece, which would be a pretty impressive now, much less in, um, the middle 19th century. You know, that's tens of thousands of dollars. So this is really, in many ways, an exercise in aspirational beauty. It's like a fashion show or an Instagram feed. Um, the New York Herald talked about Lavinia's wedding gown. So we have some great detail about that. 
and it was taffeta and it kind of was a gradient from an amber to a white color. Um, the dress was silk and tulle and lace and it had seed pearls sewn on it. Um, and actually very similar to the theme of Jill Biden's inaugural dress where it had flowers um, embroidered from each of the 50 states, Lavinia's skirt was designed with uh, floral and botanical designs representing her worldwide appeal. So there was corn for America and English roses and shamrocks and thistles and grapes. Um, and the designer Ellen DeMorest, who, um, if you're into sewing, she was the person who is credited with inventing paper sewing patterns, um, was the bridal designer for Lavinia Warren and made her two gowns for the wedding because, again, in a very modern sense, she had to change for the reception. Um, and the general, to his credit, had arranged $10,000 of jewelry for his bride. So this is very much a red carpet moment where we're talking about who are you wearing? Where are your jewels from? Um, also the bridesmaids had puffy dresses because brides have always apparently wanted to put their bridesmaids in puffy dresses. Um, I've showed, uh, I've showing a few photos here of Lavinia in different dresses, different fashions that show off um, a form that queens might envy is how one paper described her. Um, the bodice in, and the cape are both Barnum Museum items. Um, the bodice shows kind of how she would dress on trend. This is nipped in at the waist. It's a bone bodice um, with silk. And um, our curators have figured out that it may well have been trimmed in ribbon or lace at one point, um, but it would have had a full matching skirt. Um, and then the ermine cape is just fantastic. Um, it is said, well, it's said that she received an ermine cape as a gift from Queen Victoria, because what would, what would a, 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 the Queen of England give to the Queen of Beauty? So she has an ermine cape, but we're not sure that this was the actual gift uh, from Victoria because photographs suggest Lavinia had more than one. So there's this, this sense of just participating in high fashion. Um, and here, Lavinia and her sister, Minnie Warren, were known as fashion plates. Um, there's a great photo I've seen of Minnie in a tuxedo style pantsuit. It's very um, contemporary. But paper dolls um, were a commercial product at the time and very popular. Um, and there's two aspects here that we can kind of think and talk about. Um, yes, there's the fun of changing the dolls, many outfits and kind of having fun with fashion. But a little more problematically, it does make literal dolls of little people and reduces them to kind of a childlike figure. Um, and this was certainly something that both Lavinia and Minnie um, dealt with during their career. You know, people assuming that because they were small physically, that they were somehow less able or less intelligent than typically sized adults. And this absolutely was not the case, but it's something we have to think about throughout um, talking about Lavinia Wara and Charles Stratton, any other little people in performance at this time, is that there is a tendency um, to kind of infantilize them a little bit um, that you can see. And on the left on this slide is a great modern craft you can download on the Barnum Museum's digital archive um, if you want to have some 19th century paper doll fun today. All right, so Lavinia Warren and Charles Stratton and their management, they were experts at using mass media. And this started with P.T. Barnum because he was a promotional genius, um, but it continued forward for many, many decades as they toured under their own company. There was the, the Tom Thumb Company. Um, the wedding resulted in a lot of press coverage, both in the run up to the date and afterwards, they were on the covers of magazines. You can see here, this is the cover of Harper's Weekly. Um, they were front page news. This was, this was a big deal. Um, and you know, the paper economy is a big part of this. Um, in the period where Barnum and Charles Stratton were each coming into their fame, and again, they were, they were very much hand in hand. Um, this was also the time where the penny press comes into its own. Um, news starts to be printed more often, more cheaply for more people. Um, and because there's more paper, more column inches to fill, you get a more sensational lens in some cases. Um, so public culture, fan culture starts to become a thing. There's an idea of a common experience of public events. You know, think back to that quote about the fairy wedding. Did you or did you not see Tom Thumb married? It's not just about the event, it's about the public dialogue around the event and the experience of the event. Um, there's, and again, Barnum was one of the, the 
major drivers in this mass media culture. And as far as Lavinia Warren's concerned, we see the use of the press throughout her career and not just in that kind of traditional stereotypical Barnum vein as just throwing as many articles out there as you can. Um, it was common at the time to produce particular images to suit the popular demand. Um, Lavinia and Charlie posed in their wedding outfits for repeat wedding portraits over time. Um, and in one of the most famous instances of public relations spin, um, they often staged photos with borrowed babies. Um, and you see that on the top right here in whatever location they were performing. The couple did not have children, but people liked the story. And so there were these produced images of Lavinia or the couple holding an infant. So, you know, the wedding and its follow on touring, it was a chance for the public to join in this festival of luxury. Um, to think about high-end travel and dignitaries and fame, fashion, fortune. Um, you know, coverage genuinely fawned over the couple, but they also did make a little bit of a winking joke. Um, again, this tendency to make, to use their small size to make it seem like they were kind of playing at society. Um, but the, their fame and the excess of this event was no joke. Um, the wedding, the visit to the White House, the touring, they were genuinely popular. Um, you know, like many of Barnum's other employees, their fame went beyond simply being a curiosity. Um, you know, if, if Lavinia and Charles were only, a, if, if their size was all they were, if they were only a funny novelty act to broader society, they would not have stayed famous for decades. And keep in mind that many sideshow um, or dime museum attractions were one hit wonders, you know, attractions that were just up for a short time until popular demand threw something else on the front pages. Charlie and Lavinia, they were talented, they were charming, they were intelligent in their use of the media and how they used it to promote their status, their talent and their activities. And I think this really sets them apart. So to this end, people think often of, um, sideshow or um, human curiosity entertainments as passive things, just an oddity that's put on stage for people to, to walk by and look, you, all you're doing is demonstrating something that's odd or different. Um, and certainly there were human curiosities who were presented in this way, but the Strattons, Charlie and Lavinia, particularly also let's note as a white couple with the backing of a well-to-do businessman like Barnum, they had a certain sort of advantage and platform. Um, and different talk entirely. Some of you um, may have been around when I, I spoke about Millie Christine a while back. Performers who were non-white or who were disabled were often in a very different experience and that's an entirely separate talk on its own. So performance, you keep hearing about these levees and these performances that Charlie and Lavinia um, would hold. So you might think of these in some ways like a late night talk show or a variety show. There was a grab bag of smaller entertainments here and there, and a main act that might involve music or dancing, um, impressions, theater, comedy, um, travel stories. Uh, Charles Stratton as General Tom Thumb was a gifted performer who he would do elaborate costumed impressions and comedy and singing. So this involved actual performance skill. And like a late night host, someone like Lavinia had to be able to handle an audience on stage, in receptions. They had to be generally very able to handle the public. Um, and this playbill here, which was from an English performance, I love because it talks about the farewell tour. Um, and that was very much like, you know, Cher or Elton John, where they were saying farewell an awful lot. So the Tom Thumb Company traveled the world. They, they did for years. Um, Lavinia, Charlie, George, and Minnie, um, Commodore Nutt and Minnie Warren, they sailed all over the world. There was a three-year period where they went to um, Eastern and Southeastern Asia, um, Australia, the Middle East, the Mediterranean, Europe. They, they really went around the globe. Um, they traveled more than 50,000 miles by sea and gave more than 1,400 shows on this tour, if you think about that. And as they traveled more, later tours meant that a lot of their performance would be sharing their travel stories, because in many cases, they were talking to audiences who had never been to Japan or Australia or the Mediterranean, and they could talk about their travel experiences. 
1876, P.T. Barnum gave up his ownership share in the General Tom Thumb Company, um, giving it, he gave his share to Tom and Lavinia and their manager, Sylvester Bleeker. And he said, you know what, you guys have done all the heavy lifting. You deserve my share of this. And I love this quote. He says, but don't thank me. You could easily have thrown the old man overboard long ago as thousands would have done, but I honor you for your friendship and fidelity to me. God bless you for it. Um, so performance career for many, many years. Um, Charles Stratton died at age 45 in the 1880s of a stroke. Um, and Minnie Warren had died by that point as well. Um, she was pregnant and died in childbirth. Um, and Lavinia at that point, having lost her sister and her husband was pretty lonely and heartbroken. Um, over the years, she developed a relationship with a man named Primo Magri, who was a little person who had at times traveled with the Tom Thumb Company. Um, and they married in 1885. And since Primo Magri was a count, Lavinia Warren became a countess. Um, performance was still very much part of her later life uh, for a couple reasons. Though Charlie and Lavinia had earned a lot, they had also spent a lot over the years. And um, Count Magri apparently had a real taste for the high life. So touring uh, took the place of retirement. Um, in the later years, they spent a couple of summers at Coney Island um, in a um, contrived village of little people. And they perform now and again, and they're even in a 1915 film, a very early film called The Lilliputian's Courtship. Um, and at this time, Lavinia wrote an autobiography as well um, in the early 1900s, kind of talking about her, her years and her travels. Um, and you can see, I love this picture on the right. Um, you can see her in her later years. And it's not always common that we have images from throughout someone's life so that we can see how time treated them. Um, Lavinia died in 1919, and she's buried with Charles Stratton in Mountain Grove Cemetery in Bridgeport. Um, she talked about belonging to the public over her life in many ways. Um, she wrote that, I have shaken hands with more human beings, royal and plebeian, rich and poor, great and small, old and young, native and foreign, than any other woman in existence. Um, and that's a, a large scale look at why I think in her motion, her fashion, her public skills, her taste for adventure, Lavinia Warren was one of our first modern celebrities. Um, and I think I'm gonna stop it there and see if anybody has any questions or if we can kind of take this into a little bit of discussion at this point. Betsy, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm popping in, this is Jennifer. I, yes, brava, uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm gonna jump in and start some discussion because sure. I'm fascinated. I know we've got a string of questions that have come through chat and we will get to those, but but I wanted to circle back the, the fairy wedding and thinking about that. Um, you know, today we, as a culture in, in, in America and in Western society, we feel such ownership over celebrity relationships, right? We, we expect to see images from weddings of people who have achieved fame. And I'm wondering in this time point, I don't, I don't know how much context you have. Obviously royal weddings, you know, those, those weddings of state would have been big things, but I personally can't think of anything in the entertainment, the popular culture industry up to that point. Was, it, was this the first celebrity wedding? I, I, I think it's safe to say it probably was. You know, fa famous last words, if I say the first, someone will find something. But no, I sure. think uh, on this scale and of this nature, I think it was. Um, certainly, as you said, you know, royal occasions started to ramp up in scale at this point. I remember um, what's his name? William Banting, who was a British um, cabinet maker who had a royal, like he started working on royal funerals and royal uh, weddings to make them kind of grand pomp and circumstance. But yeah, this was, this had nothing to do with politics or, um, it, as you said, it was exactly, it was not an obligation associated with somebody's station. It was, it was enthusiasm. And, and there clearly was because we have all of these great accounts of people outside that really just want to see what's going on. Right. Kind of and be part of, be part of the rush and the experience. Well, and it seems to me to collect some of it in some way. Um, I think both the Barnum Museum, the Ringling, and I suspect our colleagues at other 
organizations that collect circus and allied arts have all kinds of images, you know, the, the carte de visites and the cabinet cards, the, the wonderful little lockets, the somebody's luggage lockets that unfold yeah. into images of, from the wedding and from their relationship. Um, I, it's just interesting to me how quickly we as a culture decided that we get to to kind of own part of somebody's story because they're public facing. And, yeah. um, you know, obviously Barnum, and I, I would love your thoughts on this, that Barnum as a promoter is a big, big, big piece of that. But Absolutely. to a point that you made along the way, there has to be some kind of charisma to the performer themselves, something that that makes us as a big group want to know more and want to, to see more of them. So... Yeah. Um, I, I, well, and as you said, think. I think there, there has to be a connection and an intimacy there where, where the audience member feels some connection, like, I know this person. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I'll put I, the, actually, I'll go back to this slide because it's just like here, you, like the, the portrait of the fairy wedding group, like the idea that these portraits were not only produced, but reproduced because people were so eager to see them. Yeah, it's 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 amazing how how it proliferated out, um, and not just in the United States, but certainly into Europe. And this is some and, something that someone I, it's well out of my area, but I'd love to hear from someone who's you know better informed about fashion history. Um, that you know the the typical what we understand is the typical white wedding gown was not always typical, and this seems like a, a good example of a kind of grand princess style white wedding gown being used. And I'm, I'm curious as to kind of when that became popular. I, I think there's some really interesting questions about how the fashion industry is part of that. I, I think, are, are we at the point that we can open up maybe to questions? I just noticed that, that um, we are joined today by some colleagues from the Barnum Museum. Um, Kathy Marr, I just saw pop up commenting on Queen Victoria's wedding gown being oh, being really absolutely. the the moment, and um, you know, isn't that interesting? So it's really kind of right in line with. There's also actually, I, I found when I was looking into things like the saving the pieces of wedding cake, um, Christie's auctioned what was alleged to be a piece of Queen Victoria's wedding cake at one point. So this this was a thing. It would be interesting just to see the parallels that happened there, right? You know, with with because I imagine Queen Victoria's wedding, I don't know exactly how many decades that would have been before uh, Lavinia Warren's, but that had to be one of the biggest global events of that that type before this this wedding. So interesting, um, Laura. I don't know if you've been monitoring the chat, and or I can go up and we can start. Yeah, we've got it. a number of questions, some of which have been answered by other. Uh, audience members in the chat, which is really wonderful. Um, Stacy is asking, do you think Lavinia had real feelings for Nut? Uh, she says she's from New Hampshire, so she has a lot of interest. I never know how much is Barnum fantasy and what is truth. And I've read Lavinia's bio, and I know it's not all reliable when it comes to that relationship. Yeah, I, I am. I have some skepticism about kind of the the love triangle being constructed there. Um, there, you know, there, as with almost everything in the space, there may have been a kernel of truth there, but um, turning it into, I, I don't, I, I share your skepticism. <laughs> um, I mean, and, and a lot of this foursome here was kind of fictionalized for their public facing time. Like I said, you've got, we're taking pictures with random babies and, you know, uh, Commodore Nutt and Minnie were kind of portrayed as the second couple here, despite the fact that they were not a couple, but it was just kind of part of the, the touring mechanics here. So I think there was a lot of what we, again, from a modern perspective would call scripted reality. Yep. Um, and we've had a request if we could maybe stop the screen share so people can see your faces a little bit bigger. Oh, sure. Um, and a, a question from Molly about um, what perhaps would have been the trajectory of Lavinia's life if she hadn't uh, found fame with Barnum. And we know she was a school teacher, but do you think she, um, you know, what, what can you say about that, the role that Barnum well, played? By all accounts, when, and again, in her autobiography, when she talks about um, her career as a teacher, she says she thought it was proper and genial. And, and you get the sense that that would have, not only been agreeable to her and something that was respected in her community, but um, you know, a, an acceptable career for a woman to have at that point. Um, 
and you know her family was all from that part of Massachusetts um she had there were eight kids in the family so had she not joined the showboat or or met up with Barnum you know there's I think there's two questions there had she just lived her life in Massachusetts I think she would have just lived her life um as any other member of her family might you know had Barnum not picked up on her would she have continued um in showboating or dime museum work it's hard to say um, I think that would have depended on her openness to it or what opportunities came up for her. But certainly she, it, it, her trajectory took off like a shot after that short period on the showboat and Barnum kind of, she got right into $2,000 gowns and newspaper debuts. And, you know, that, that has its, that has its ups and downs. And I see we have a couple of people have unmuted. If there's anyone who wants to ask a question verbally, please feel free to do that. I'll also plug if anyone wants to learn more, one moment. So there is not only Lavinia's autobiography, which you can seek out. Um, there is a, if any of you have kids who might be interested, there's a really great young readers book about Lavinia that came out pretty recently. And Eric Lehman's book about Charles Stratton um, obviously has some really good things to say about Lavinia as well. I have a question. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? My yes, off? I can. Human oddities today, we see them the other extreme. We're above in, in basketball, we're above seven feet now, and we're seeing some uh, seven feet two, seven feet three. Could a small couple today be accepted as curiosities? In other words, uh, uh, where, where do small people fit in today? Is there any recognition of anything like that? Well, absolutely. And I think within, within the community, there's a sense of how little people would like to be referred to and recognized and regarded. Um, and in some as with almost any demographic, some people would prefer not to call attention to it as a curiosity, but you may remember, I think it was TLC, um, had a reality show about little people within recent memory, which you could argue is just, it's the same kind of entertainment mm -hmm. put into a modern media context. Um, I, I think there's always room for curiosity in popular culture. Um, we, we may wrap it up differently or decide it's palatable in different ways, but I think we're much more sensitive now to, um, you know, particularly within disability studies or different communities of listening to people and how they want to be presented and regarded. Thank you. Yeah. And I wanted to follow up on that, Betsy. I was thinking when you spoke about the, some of the photographs that they had where they borrowed babies. Um, it, it, it took me back to our previous speaker, Kat Vecchio talked about images of women on the circus lot performing domesticity. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I was thinking that in what I know of, of Lavinia's story, you know, the baby is the one moment that you really see that sense of, of performing something that's this very specific domestic yeah. task. Um, so I guess it's a, a two, part question or a thought, you know, one within her autobiography and the other pieces, are, th are there moments that they talk more about her performing some of these standard moments of the domestic life of a woman? Or are they aligning her more with royalty, much like you get General Tom Thumb? Just curious I think what you it's think. A, it's a little more of the latter. Um, and it, her autobiography is, is, is challenging to read because it um, it appears to have been written kind of piecemeal at two different times. And she also includes chunks of other people's writing where she'll kind of go, oh, Barnum said this, or Sylvester Bleeker said this. So you kind of have to keep a certain skepticism throughout. Um, she talks, there, there are little moments where you kind of get what I think is a truer emotion. Um, like when she talks about um, her sister, particularly and like the, the reality. So everyone loved the pictures with the babies because it presented this idea of kind of idyllic family life. Um, but the reality was Minnie passed away um, in childbirth because as a little person, it was physically very difficult, um, not to mention the idea that um, a little person can become pregnant with a 
typically sized baby. And that presents a lot of complications. Can I um, um, ask something regarding to what Jennifer is talking about? I'm the one who asked the question about the, um, the baby in the photograph. Um, so because I live in New Hampshire and New England, I'm sort of obsessed with this and I've researched a lot. So I know you mentioned the Uncle Gus baby, which I think is hysterical that they're calling a baby Uncle Gus. But I know there were other babies they borrowed. And I know that Barnum and at least his wife supported an orphanage in Bridgeport. Did they borrow any of those babies? Because that's for some reason what I thought. I don't honestly, I don't know for sure, but that's certainly an interesting question. Yeah, I'm not, I'm kind of obsessed with the whole baby and the Levin and the mini you know, Minnie dying in childbirth and that whole irony. Um, it's just so, there's so much pathos there. And then being from New Hampshire and the and the way Commodore Nutt's life ended, which was just drinking himself to death at a bar in New York. So, I mean, I just, there's just so much, I mean, there's that whole presentation of Barnum's, the happy life of the, of the little people, but there is all, and this is where I think Barnum is somewhat culpable. The whole like forcing that romance story and that baby story is really kind of dark. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this was true, not just for little people. I think across the board in, in curiosities, you have to be very careful about reading anybody's pamphlet or anybody's promotional literature because it was, as, as I said, it's scripted reality. It's what's going to interest the audience. And as you say, you know, we have to stop and remember that all these people had private interior lives that may not have, that may have been very happy or may not have been at different times. I mean, her biography is this, I'm, I'm a journalist. So her biography, there's so many, so much of it that's not reliable. So it's really hard to like call out what's real and what isn't. I do think when she writes about her sister's death, there's something there, but a lot of it you just know isn't true or, or it's just gotten from third sources. Or or it's very diplomatic in a PR way. Yeah. There's a lot of that too, which again, it was, is very much a characteristic of modern celebrity journalism. I love those parallels that you can pull to today. I mean, a lot of, you read any of these promotional things and like do a little shifting that could be in People Magazine very easily. <laughs> right, exactly. And and especially the, the idea of, of people with, with variable bodies, with different bodies. Um, all of these reality TV shows, um, we, we talk about this sometimes here, it's such a controlled experience in, in the contemporary society. With, with Tom Thumb and Lavinia Warren, people were, I, I guess their, their, their image was mediated because of the massive amount of photography that was shared. Um, a, a lot of performers, you saw them live and in person, so there was at least this interaction of one human looking at another. Um, I, I'm just thinking, Betsy, I'm sorry, you can, you can comment on that or we can open it up to the next question. I just think it, it, these are wonderful windows for us to, to consider how we have always interacted with things that we're curious, with people we're curious about, with things that we are curious about. We like to look and we like to question. Um, and sometimes we like the story to be easier to consume than it actually is. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think those were all of the questions from the chat. Um, so unless anybody has anything else for Betsy or for Jennifer, I just want to thank you all. And thank you so much, Betsy. It was fa fabulous as always. And we're so appreciative of your time. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, absolutely. And Everyone, first of all, I also want to thank um, Kathy Marr and Adrian St. Pierre, who I believe is still here, for joining us from the Barnum Museum today and for sharing out to, to your membership. Um, I love it. I love it when our collections and our, our work together overlaps because our stories are richer when we work on them together. Um, I'm so grateful to Betsy once again for doing a stellar job of, of sharing someone's story and helping us get more insight into how that story has, has transpired and changed how we are today. Um, and finally, I do want to encourage everyone to join us on May 20th for the final, uh, final piece of this series when we will be joined by Amelia Osterud, who will tell us about the stories we tell about presenting tattooed women to audiences. Um, it's going to be a wonderful piece to conclude what has been a, a joy of a series to work on. Thank you all and have a great day. And I realized I was remiss. There was one question from Faith. I don't know if it ever got answered. Um, is the Barnum Museum currently open and what is the status of the Barnum Museum? 
the Barnum Museum. So please go to, uh, I'm going to get in Barnum mode. Um, please go to the website. Um, we have a YouTube channel that's doing a lot right now. The museum is not physically open for a combination of construction and COVID-19 related reasons, but there is continuing programming. Um, so, you know, you may not be able to set foot inside the building, but you can interact with the museum very easily. Um, a lot of the images I showed today are from the Connecticut Digital Archive, where the Barnum Museum and the Bridgeport History Center share some Barnum collections. And the YouTube channel's great. It's getting new content all the time. And there's videos about things like Tom Thumb's wedding cake. Thank you very much. And thank you all so much for joining us today. We hope to see you next time.